Hello friends and shalom. This is Tom with Truth Ignited Ministry where we talk about what they don't teach in the churches. And today I'm bringing you a message that I've titled Satan's Tactic Revealed. And you know, we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and we find Satan giving a three-pronged attack because Revelation 12, 9 tells us that the ancient serpent who deceives the world is Satan. And that began in Genesis chapter 3 where the serpent met Eve in the midst of the garden, in the midst where there was two trees and one tree was forbidden, it was prohibited. Yah said of that tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. He said, don't eat the fruit of that tree. But then when you get to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, we find the serpent slithering around in the branches of that tree. And we find Eve and Adam was clearly there with her. And they approached that tree and that serpent was there slithering through the branches. And he came along with his hissing tongue. <laughs> And he said, he asked the, the woman, he looked at her, and he said, it says that the serpent was shrewder than any animal that Yah had made. And so it asked the woman, did Yah really say that you must not eat of all the trees in the garden? This is one of the trees in the garden, it said. Surely God didn't mean that you can't eat this tree if he said you can eat from all the trees. So he asked the question he came along and that was the first part of his tactic was he was trying to get to build doubt he was trying to get you to question he was trying to get Eve to question the commandment of Yah he came along and he said did God really say if you go back to King James English half God said because, because he was in the tree and he said, did God really say he wanted to create doubt? He wanted you to question the commandment. But then if you skip down to verse four, because Eve tried to rationalize that in verses two and three. But then in verse four, the serpent said, you won't surely die. You won't surely die if you eat the fruit of the tree. And then, he, and then in verse 5, but because that was the second part of the command though of his attack, he was he built doubt. And then he said, he said, it's you know, even if God meant it, there's no penalty for it. He created doubt in your mind. But then he said, there's really no penalty. Forget about what God said. There's no penalty for breaking the commandment of God. And then in verse 5, he says, Yah knows that when you eat of it. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like Yah. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that, that's the final part of his attack. He says, he says, first he creates doubt. Then he says that there's no penalty. But then he says that you're missing out on something. If you don't break the commandment, there's something you're missing out on. There's something that God is holding back from you. There's something that you need to find. There's something that you need in your life. And the only way to get it is to break the commandment of God. That's the message of the serpent. That's the plan of Satan to get you to believe that there's something that you need in this lifetime. And the only way that you can get what you need in this lifetime is to go against the command of God. And that's what he wants you to believe. But then we come and and we come to the trees in the garden and there were two trees in the garden there were two the first we already mentioned it it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and what did they do they fell for the trick they fell for the lie they fell for the deception they fell for satan's deceitfulness and they ate something that God said not to eat. God said, that tree in the midst over there, there, don't eat the fruit of that tree. That one is off limits. You can eat all of the rest of the fruit in this luscious garden, this paradise that I've created for you. You can eat all of the fruit of the, all of the trees. And there were apple trees, and there were pear trees, and there were 
pomegranate trees and, and there were mango trees and there were fresh bananas and there was all manner of fruit growing all through the garden but there was one tree one in the midst and God said that one is for me that one is prohibited because the moment you eat of it you're gonna know something that you're not intended to know I'm trying to protect you from things that can harm you and then and then Satan to make convince them that they could eat and they ate and they ate the fruit and sin entered the world through that one act of eating something God said not to eat and 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 really you know, when you think about it, how often today do we see Christians, or most Christians today, believe that there are overriding, that there are things that override certain commandments that are given by the Father in His Torah, and the chief among them. You can talk about most of the commandments, and but, but if you get to the Leviticus 11, food laws, if you dare to tell a Christian that the Bible says not to eat pork, if you dare to tell a Christian that the Bible says not to eat shellfish, if you dare to tell a Christian that the Bible says not to eat rodents like squirrels and rabbits and number of and any number of things that the Bible says not to eat they will begin the process of twisting the scriptures they'll twist and manipulate the scriptures they'll go to certain passages like Mark chapter 7 and they'll go to Acts chapter 10 and they'll go to Romans chapter 14 and they'll go to Colossians chapter 2 and they'll go to 1st Timothy chapter 4 and they'll twist and they'll twist and they'll twist and they'll manipulate what those verses are saying because they've not studied them in context they've just taken what they've been told and they've been sold a lie that those scriptures say that they don't have to follow the food laws it's it's like the, the Satan, the question is resurfaced. It's come back through the Christian religion. Did God really say that Christians need to follow the Torah food laws? Did God really say that Christians need to keep the Sabbath day? Which, by the way, the Sabbath is not Sunday. Jesus is not your Sabbath. The Bible never says that Jesus is your Sabbath. The Sabbath is not a concept. It's not whenever you can squeeze in a day off of work. The Sabbath is the seventh day of the biblical week. It coincides with sunset Friday to sunset Saturday on our modern secular calendars. That is the Sabbath. Did God really say that Christians need to keep the Torah appointed feasts of our God? The spring feast days, Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits and the feast of Shavuot, the day of Pentecost and the fall feast days of the day of the shofars, the day of atonement, and the feast of Sukkot, or tabernacles. Did God really say that Christians cannot are not to tattoo their bodies? Did God really say that Christians cannot wear clothing made of wool and made of linen together? They say, weren't these things just for the Jews? They say that those are ceremonial commandments and somehow claim that because they've labeled them as ceremonial commandments that they don't have to keep them. But the Bible does not support this idea that there are moral commandments that carry forward and there are so-called ceremonial commandments that have been done away with. That message is not supported in your Bible. That's made up by man made religion and you need to stop thinking that way because the commandment of God is eternal it is forever it is sealed in the word of God in Eden in Eden the serpent asked the question did God really say today 
It's the Christian pastor who stands in the pulpit and addresses a congregation of people and says, did God really say that we need to follow those old food laws? Did God really say that we need to keep the Sabbath and those Jewish holidays? Because they don't call them the feasts of Yah. They call them Jewish holidays because that somehow makes it mean in their mind that they're not for them, but they are for all people of all times in history. Exodus 12, 49, Numbers 15, 16, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. These verses prove that the Torah is for all people. There is neither Jew nor Greek, but all are one in Messiah. All are for these commandments. These commandments are for all. If you're in covenant with Yah, then these commandments are for you. We could alternately call the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the tree of forbidden knowledge because it was not only the piece of fruit hanging from the tree that was prohibited, but there was knowledge, there was certain knowledge that God did not want us to have. And it wasn't because he was trying to keep something from us. It was because there was something he wanted to protect us from. And that thing is sin. He wanted to protect us from sin. And there was knowledge that people were told not to get into. And when we bring that into modern times, look at the face of religion. Look at, look at the totality of Christianity. Christian religion today, whether it's mainstream Christian religion or Torah positive, even Torah positive Christian religion. We see it in things like the so-called Hebrew Roots Movement. We see it even in Messianic Jewish circles, certain Messianic circles. We see them and we see things like Bible codes where you where the claim is that you can start with one letter and skip so many letters and get an another letter and skip so many letters and eventually you find a word and if you find two or three words you find supposedly an encoded message but this has been debunked it's been shown to be false and then there are Hebrew word picture codes where people say that Hebrew letters go back to an ancient pictograph form which isn't even Hebrew it's the old Canaanite the old pagan Canaanite language and they say that you can take these pictures and you can assign a meaning to them. And then you can take a word from the Hebrew and you can put the pictures together. And then you can put the meaning of the pictures together and create a prophetic message. But this too has failed the test. And then you've got gematria and numerology, which is a form of witchcraft. And then you've got the Kabbalist method of, of trying to understand scripture that they call Pardes. Pardes. P-R-D-S. And it's a system that goes through four supposed steps of understanding passages of scripture. And what it is, it's a path to paradise, a path to Eden through forbidden knowledge because the last step is called Sud. And if you understand what that means, it's talking about mystical and esoteric forms of knowledge. It's talking about knowledge that God said he's forbidden because Deuteronomy 29 verse 28 says that the secret things belong to Yah and the revealed things are for us and the purpose that the secret things belong to Yah and the revealed things belong to us is for the purpose that we will live by the Torah of Yah. Look, if it's not plain as day in the Bible, don't chase after it. It's not for you. It's fruit hanging from the tree of forbidden knowledge. And God said, don't touch it. God said, that's for me to worry about, not for you to try to seek out and discover secret mysteries. He said, I, if it's for you, I already gave it to you in my word, the Bible. Don't chase after things that go beyond the revealed text of the Bible. Listen, if you need a fourfold approach to the scripture, don't go through the Kabbalist witchcraft method of finding truth 
in the scripture. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for one, teaching, two, reproof, three, restoration, and four, training in righteousness. That is your fourfold approach to understanding what the Bible says. Not some witchcraft, Kabbalist method that's supposed to lead you to paradise of any other way than through Yeshua, your Messiah. Christians like to say that this is not a salvation issue. Whatever it is, they say the food laws are not a salvation issue. They say that keeping the Sabbath is not a salvation issue. They say that the feast days might seem good and neat and trendy, but they're not a salvation issue, they say. They say that it's not a salvation issue if you tattoo your body despite the commandment of God saying, not to tattoo your body. They certainly would say that wearing wool and linen together is not a salvation issue. They would certainly say that so many things that they write off as ceremonial commandments in the scripture, in the Torah, they would say that these things are not a salvation issue. They say nobody goes to hell for eating pork. Nobody goes to hell for eating shellfish. Nobody goes to hell for eating unclean things. Nobody goes to hell if they don't keep the Sabbath. Nobody goes to hell if they don't celebrate those feast days. Nobody's going to go to hell, they say, if they celebrate Roman Catholic holidays like Christmas and Easter and Halloween. Nobody goes to hell just because they got a tattoo. That's what they say. That's what they want you to believe. And that's the same thing the serpent said. You will not surely die. You will not go to hell. It's not a salvation issue. There's no penalty for it. He's created the doubt. Did God really say that Christians need to follow the Torah? Nobody goes to hell if they don't follow the Torah. It's the same thing that Satan did in the Garden of Eden. It's no different than what he did when he slithered around in that tree. And he said, did God really say that you can't eat this tree, the fruit of this tree? You won't surely die. You will be like God. Friends, I don't know how to make it any more plain than what this passage says if we really honestly go back to the beginning and that's why it's so essential that you begin to read the bible in the book of beginnings the book of genesis because if you listen to christianity they always want you to start in one of the gospels it's usually matthew because it's the first gospel or john because they somehow think that john is is this super gospel but they start you in one of the gospels and then they lead you to Paul's writings because they want you to believe that Paul was an apostle who came along and said, hey, all of the stuff that is written in the Bible before I, Paul, came along was wrong. I'm going to show you the real path. That's what they believe, Paul said. But Paul, he was charged with that. He was arrested in Jerusalem and they charged him with teaching against the Torah. And he said, no, 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 no. No, no, that is not what I teach. He said, I believe everything in the Torah, in the prophets, Acts 24, 14. He said, I've never gone against the Torah or the temple. Acts 25 verse 8. And then when you go to the Acts chapter 22, you read down. It says that he was teaching them about the Yeshua using the Torah. How in the world is he going to teach about Yeshua using the Torah if his message was that the Torah is obsolete? That's, that's confused Christianity that believes these things. And listen. The next thing that the serpent did in Eden, he said, you will be like God. You will be like God. He said, this is what you, this is why God doesn't want you to eat the fruit. Because when you do, you will become like God. 
but they were already like God. It says that God created them in his own likeness and in his own image. But he, they became convinced that they needed to be like God through doing something that God said not to do. And then they became their own God. When you violate the commandment of God, you become your own God in your own mind. Either you are submitted to Yah through obedience to his Torah, or you become your own God through your rebellion and your defiance of his Torah, through these false counterfeit Christian beliefs they'll try to tell you that you don't have to obey that you don't have to live daily by the commandment of God that's what he wants you to believe that's his whole purpose that's his tactic his tactic is threefold he wants to create doubt you didn't you do you have to keep the commandment is it really a salvation issue are you really going to go to hell for that don't you know that if you teach that people have to obey the commandment or they'll go to hell you're preaching legalism guess what legalism is a word never found one time in your bible but there are some other words of significance lawlessness is in your bible lukewarm is in your bible lasciviousness is in your bible and if you want to buy into the concept that these things are not a salvation issue that these things will not send you to hell you've already bought into satan's tactic of deception there is the tree of life the tree of life is it was also in the midst of the garden that was the other tree that was in the midst of the garden and they had full access to the tree of life but the moment they broke the commandment the moment they ate the fruit that god said not to eat the moment they partook of the tree of forbidden knowledge God came along and he said, we have to prevent them from accessing the tree of life anymore. Because if they do, they will live forever in their state of sin. And I have to fix this. And before I can fix this, I have to cut off the path to the tree of life because if they access it while they're in a state of sin they will be forever in a state of sin and i will not be able to redeem them so he placed a cherub with a flaming sword to guard the way of the tree of life because through their defiance they were banished they were cut off they were prohibited from accessing the tree of life But then, if you turn to Revelation 22, in verse number 14, it says, in some translations, it says, those who wash their robes. What does that mean? That's a cultural idiom. It's a slang term for obeying the commandments. That's why other translations say, those who obey the commandments, those who live by the Torah of Yah, they will be given access to that very same tree of life. And what is the tree of life? The Bible tells us what the tree of life is. Proverbs chapter 3, it opens up speaking of obeying the Torah, obeying the mitzvot. And then if you go to verse 18, Proverbs chapter 3, then verse 18, it says she, speaking of the Torah, she is a tree of life. The Torah is a tree of life. That's what your Bible says. It says that the Torah of Yah is a tree of life. And then, if you go to Proverbs chapter 11, in verse 30, it says, The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. That's what your Bible says. And what is righteousness? The Bible tells us what righteousness is, just like it tells us what sin is. In 1 John 3, 4, it says that sin is lawlessness. Sin is when you break, transgress, violate the Torah 
of Yah. That is the biblical definition of sin. And you have to understand that that's what sin is. It's when you break the Torah. People ask me, if I think that people are going to go to hell for such and such, they ask me, is this a sin to eat unclean things? Sin is the breaking of the Torah. They ask me, is it a sin if I don't keep the Sabbath day? Sin is the breaking of the Torah. Is it a sin if I celebrate Christmas and Easter? Sin is breaking the Torah. Is it a sin if I don't keep Keep the feast days or if I don't keep the Jewish holidays sin is breaking the Torah is it a sin if I tattoo my body sin is the breaking of the Torah is it a sin I know it sounds strange I know that people have wrestled over this one and they've looked at it and they have said that doesn't make any sense I don't understand why that would be in there why would God say not to wear wool and linen together? Is it a sin if I wear clothing made of wool and linen together? Sin is breaking the Torah. That's what your Bible says. You can't get around what your Bible says unless you are your own serpent in your own mind saying, did God say that I have to obey these commandments? I don't think I I don't think these are a salvation issue and you become your own God in defiance of the God of creation that's what you've become Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 25 and I have to close with this it says it will be counted as righteousness if we do if we follow if we obey if we live our lives every day according to the commandment of Yah according to the Torah of Yah is it a sin to break the Torah yes is it a sin to defy the commandment of God yes and I admonish you today please if I can do anything to convince you just obey the Bible if you truly believe that Yah is the creator and if you truly believe that Yeshua is your Messiah and you truly believe that you are filled with the Spirit of God then you will want to obey you will want to walk in righteousness and live through obedience to his Torah do not fall for the tactic of Satan Follow the path of righteousness, obedience to the Torah. Friends, remember that there's much to be gained by a return to the discarded values of the past. And I'm going to see you in the next message. Shalom. Hey there, I'm so glad you tuned in today. Now, if you enjoy the teachings of Truth Ignited and you want to financially support the ministry, we want to offer you a few ways to do that. First, we've got our cash app. Scan the QR code or use dollar sign Truth Ignited. Now, this is a preferred method because we don't incur any fees for this service. But we understand that not everybody uses the cash app, so you can also go to our Spotify for Podcasters page right here. And you can sign up to become a $5 or $10 monthly partner. You can also visit truthignited.com and give your financial support there and find a lot more great messages just like the one you listen to. Also, be sure to check out our T Public store where you can find a lot of really cool merchandise, t-shirts and other items that you can use to show off your faith. Be sure to follow Truth Ignited on Facebook, Twitter, or X, YouTube, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And remember to share these messages on all of your social media pages. I'll see you next time. Blessings and Shalom.